Thank you. Uh, it's nice to be here. I'm uh, Hong Yi Li from National Taiwan University. And this tutorial is about generative adversarial network and its application to speech processing and natural language processing. And this tutorial is actually very long from 2 to the 6. So uh, to so I don't I don't want you to be very tired. So we will have we will take a break two times. So for the first lecture, we will take a break around three ten. I believe most of you know what is generated a virtual network, right? So for those who have heard GAN, please raise your hand. So okay, please put down your hand. For those who have never heard GAN, please raise your hand. Probably uh, okay. Okay, cool, cool. So for those who have never heard the word game before, let me show you this slide to t let you know how important this technology is. So this is a post on Quora, and someone asked what are some reason and potentially upcoming breakthrough in unsupervised learning. And Yang Lekang, I believe everyone in this room know Yang Lekang, right? He's the inventor of CNN. Yang Lekang said, adversarial training is the coolest thing since sliced bread. So it's the coolest thing ever. And there's another post. Someone asked, what are some uh, reasons and potentially upcoming breakthrough in deep learning? And Yang Lekang said, the variation, again, and the variation they are now being proposed is the most interesting idea in the last 10 years in machine learning. So this is a very important technology. To show how popular this technology is, you can Google some uh, a web page called Gen Zoo, the Zoo of Gen. And on this web page, the author already collected more than 300 different species. So there are more than 300 different kinds of Gens. So when people invent a new technology related to Gen, they just put some character before GAN. So there are lots of lots of different kinds of Gen. And actually, because you know there are only 26 English characters, so all the characters are already being used. So for example, there are two LS GAN, and they are completely different. One is loss sensitive GAN, and uh, another is this, this square GAN. They are both LS GAN, but they are completely different. Some people even say, for example, this is the paper named Variation Approach for Autoencoder Adversarial ge uh, Generative Adversarial Network. Originally, the author want to name their approach AE GAN or A GAN, but they can only name their approach Alpha GAN because other Latin prefix seem has been taken. <laughs> so let's show how popular this technology is. So, and this is the outline of, of this tutorial in the part one. I will talk about, uh, I will give a gen general introduction about generative adversarial network. And in the second part, I will show the application of this technology to speech and text. In the literature, if you are familiar with GAN, in the literature, most of the technology are proposed in image processing. But in this tutorial, I'm talking about the application of GAN to speech and text processing. And in the last part, I will talk about the recent progress in our research group. So let's start with the general introduction. So in the part one, I'm going to talk about uh, first give a general introduction of GAN, then I will talk in about conditional generation, feature extraction, unsupervised conditional generation, and finally I will connect GAN with reinforcement learning. For the general introduction of GAN, I will first use image generation as an example to show how this technology works. Then I will introduce the theory behind GAN. Then I will show some issues of GAN and some possible solution. And finally, I will talk in about the evaluation of the results. Then let's start with uh, image generation. So here, what I wanted to show you is enemy phase generation. For enemy phase generation means here is the machine, and the machine look at lots of enemy faces as example. You can collect lots of enemy faces on the internet and fit those image faces to the machine, and hopefully machine can create new energy faces after reading so many examples. And the machine which can create new image faces are called generator. So this generator is what we want to find, what we want to learn in generative adversarial network. So this is a generator, and it takes a vector as the input, and it will output an image. 
The generator is a neural network. I believe everyone in this room know what is neural network, so I do not have to introduce it. So the generator is a neural network, or you can consider it as a function. It takes a vector as input, and the output is an image. Or the output is actually a high dimensional vector, but you can interpret this high dimensional vector as an image. Each dimension in this high dimensional vector can be considered as a pixel in the image. So you can consider this vector as an image. So here is the concrete example. So uh, if you if your generator has read lots of uh, images, it can learn how to generate enemy faces. And given a random vector, and it will output an enemy faces. This is a re real example generated by the code found, at, found on the GitHub. Then if you give another vector, usually each dimension of the input vector corresponding to some characteristic of the output image. So if you modify a specific dimension, for example, you modify the first dimension, probably the length of the hair will be changed. So if you increase the value of the first dimension, the output character will have a long hair. Or you uh, change the value of another dimension, then the output character will have blue hair. Or you change the dimension of the less hair, less time, uh, you change the value of the less dimension, and the output character will sp start to smile. So it do not have mouth here, but it start to open her mouth here. And in the generated adversarial network, besides learning the generator, the most interesting part is you also have to learn a discriminator. We will show how the discriminator can improve the generator next. And for the discriminator, it's also a neural network. It's also a function. This function takes an image as input, and the output of this function would be a scalar. This scalar represents how good the input image is. So if the input image has high quality, the input image looks like an enemy face, the output, uh, the output of the discriminator will be larger. On the other hand, if the input image is poor, the output of the discriminator will be small. Uh, for example, if you provide some very realistic enemy faces to the discriminator, then the discriminator will output a larger value. Let's assume 1.0 is the largest value it can output. Then if you provide some very fake image, the image with some uh, bad quality, people will not think this as uh, the enemy face, then the discriminator will output very small value. So this is the discriminator. Then let me show you the algorithm of GAN, how we train the generator by the help of the discriminator. So first of all, because both the generator and the discriminator are networked, so you have to initialize their parameter. So Everyone knows something about, uh, everyone is familiar with deep learning in this room. So you have to initialize the parameter of generator and the discriminator. Then in each training iteration, there are two steps. In the first step, you fix your generator and only train your discriminator. And of course, in the second step, you will fix your discriminator and only train your generator. Let's first look at the first step. In the first step, you will fix your generator and only train your discriminator. So how to train the discriminator? So you train your discriminator like this. You first of all, you have a generator. And because the parameter of the generator is random initialized at the beginning, so in the first iteration, uh, you provide some random vector, but the output of the generator will be very poor image. So this vector are sample from a distribution, for example, Gaussian distribution. You will sample a set of, Gaussian, a set of vectors from a Gaussian distribution, and the generator take those vectors as input and generate some image. And at the beginning, those image will be very poor. Then from the database, to train your generator, you, to, tr to, you, to, to train the generator adversarial network, you need some example for the training. So you have a database, which are uh, the enemy faces drawn by human. Then you sample, those, you sample some example from the database. Then you use this data to train your discriminator. The target of the discriminator is it has to assign the score 1.0 to those realistic image. And it has to assign score 0.0, .0 to those generated image. Let's assume one is the largest score it can, uh, it can output, and zero is the smallest score it can output. So those image are real image, so discriminator has to assign 1.0 to those image. And those image are generated image, so the discriminator have to assign 0.0, .0 to those image. 
So based on this target, you can train your discriminator. Then in the second step, in the first step, you train your discriminator and fix your generator. In the second step, you fix your discriminator and update your generator. So this is how you update your generator. Here is the generator. It takes a vector as input and generate an enemy face. Originally, it's pretty poor. Then the discriminator will take this face as input and output a scalar, represent how good the input image is. Then the generator will learn to fool the discriminator. By f the terminology fool means the generator will update its parameter. So its output image will be different. And this discriminator take this new image as input, and the output score will be larger. As we have mentioned in the step one, the discriminator is already learned to discriminate between the good and bad image. So if your input image looks like a good image, looks like a realistic image, the output score will be larger. And the generator try to generate the image. Generator will update its parameter to generate the image, which will obtain larger score from the discriminator. That means the output of the generator looks more realistic. And to be specific, uh, to train this generator in the step two, you will consider the generator and the discriminator together as the large network. For example, if your generator is five layer network, your discriminator is five, la five layer network, you will concatenate these two network together. Then you obtain a 10 layer network. The input is a vector and the output is a scalar. So you will consider the generator and the discriminator jointly as a large network. And this image will be considered as a hidden layer. So this network has a very wide hidden layer. And the output of each neuron in this hidden layer corresponding to one pixel in the image. So this is considered as a network, and this is a very large hidden layer. Then to update the generator to fold the discriminator, I mean you use gradient ascent to update the parameters in the generator, but you fix the parameter in the discriminator. You fix the parameter in the last few layer and only update the parameter in the first few layer. And the target of training is to make the output as large as possible. So this is the basic idea of training your generator. So now we have step one, which learn a discriminator, and you have a step two, which learn a generator. Then these two steps are conducted iteratively. You train, a gen you train a discriminator, then you update your generator. Your generator will become better, then you update your discriminator again, then you update your generator again. These two steps are conducted iteratively. So the whole training process will look like this. You have to collect some real image as the example, and at the, and at the beginning, you have first version generator. You have generator version one. And the generator version one can only generate very poor image. Then you use those poor image to train the discriminator. Discriminator can discriminate the generated image and the real image. Then your generator will update its parameter. So now you have generator version two. The output of the generator version two will be more realistic because the generator version two can fool the discriminator one. The generator version two can fool the discriminator version one to make the discriminator version one consider those image as realistic image. Those image sh should be the image uh, with large score. So then based on those generated image, you will have a generator version two. Yeah, you, sorry, you will have a discriminator version two. And this discriminator Discriminator version one cannot discriminate these two kind of image, but discriminator version two is better. It can discriminate these two kind of image. Then based on discriminator version two, you update your generator again. You have generator version three, and this version three can generate the image which discriminator version two will think is real, will assign large score, but you have discriminator, ver discriminator version three which can discriminate, discriminate between these two kinds of image. So in this process, the generator will generate better, better image, and the discriminator will be more and more strict. And here I'm going to show some real example how good we can achieve with this technology. So, uh, so this is the real example. You can download the data set from this web page. Then after 100 updates, this is the output of the generator. It looks pretty 
poor, just like some uh, random noise. Then after 1,000 update, means the generator and the discriminator are both updated 1,000 times. Now the generator learned to generate the enemy faces with eyes. It, it found the generator knows that to cheat the discriminator, it has to generate uh, the image with two black circles. Then this is the result of 2,000 updates. And this is the result of 5,000 update. And now generator know that all the enemy characters has a very large eyes. So Rose characters has large eyes. So this is 10,000 updates. So now Rose images are look like the character, but it's not. It's kind of fuzzy. It's not good enough. This is uh, 20,000 times. This is. 50,000 times. Actually, this is not the best result you can obtain. Enemy face generation is the homework of my deep learning course in National Taiwan University. And this is, this is the result I do it by myself. And this is the result student hand in. So <laughs> they are very determined working on this homework. So this is the result they can obtain. So, uh, so looks pretty cool. Probably better than some enemy factory, which sometimes draw poor images. So it looks pretty cool. And of course, you can use the same technology to generate real face. So you only have to collect the faces of celebrity. There are some benchmark copas on the internet. Then you can train the generator to generate faces. So those faces are generated by the generator. And generate faces is kind of useless because you can only simply take the picture on the road to get lots of real human face. So it's useless. But with this technology, you can generate new faces. As I have mentioned, for the generator, it takes a random vector as input and generate a face. So input different vector, generate different faces. You can interpolate two vectors to generate the interpolation between faces. So if you input 0, 0.0, this is just a toy example. Usually the input vector has something like 100 dimensions. So this is just a toy example. You input 0, 0.0 and have this man's face and 0. Uh, 0 uh, 0.9.9, you have this woman's face. Then if you input the interpolation between these two vectors, you will see the change from this man's face to this woman's face. And for example, here, this woman look at the left-hand side, and this woman look at the right-hand side. And you can ask the machine to generate the interpolation between these two faces. And the machine is kind of smart. It do not simply put these two images together to generate a face with two images. It know that the interpolation of these two faces is a face look in the front. So a, a machine automatically learn that you do not have to provide any guideline, any rule. You do not have need handcrafted uh, features. Machine after machine go through probably uh, 20,000 images, you can automatically know that the interpolation of the left side and the right side is a face looking in the front. And of course, GAN is not the only way for image generation, but it's very popular. I will uh, in the... Uh, I will try to use full slides to compare another approach, VAE, with the GAN. So you can also learn a variation of autoencoder to obtain an image generation, right? I believe most of you are uh, familiar with autoencoder. So in autoencoder, you have an encoder, you have a decoder. The input is an image, and the encoder compress the input image into a code, and the decoder will decode. Uh, you will, will decode the input code into an image. And during the training, you want the input and output as close as possible. You use this way to train a variational autoencoder. And after you train your variational autoencoder, you can consider your decoder as a generator. So you do not need the encoder. You can consider your decoder. You do not need uh, the encoder. You only need your decoder. You can consider the decoder as a generator. Just input some random vector, this code are vectors, so just input some random vector, and the decoder hopefully can generate the images. Then I'm going to compare autoencoder and GAN. In autoencoder, the decoder is learned from a specific image, right? Because in autoencoder, your decoder is learned to reconstruct a specific image in the database. You want to minimize the reconstruction error. The encoder take an image as an input, and the decoder have to generate exactly the same image. So you can say that the decoder is trying to mimic a specific image. It just try to copy a specific image. 
And usually, you use L1 or L2 loss to compute the similarity between these two images. You want the uh, L1 loss or L2 loss between the output of the decoder and the target to be as small as possible. And usually, L1 or L2 loss simply lead to fuzzy image. So this is why the uh, usually autoencoder can only generate a uh, fuzzy image. So VAE is, uh, is it is widely known that VAE usually generate fuzzy images. And for GAN, GAN, for GAN, the generator is not learned from a specific image. It actually learned from the discriminator. And as you know, the network has the some capability of generalization. So if the discriminator does not simply memorize the image, it understand the image with some abstract feature. For example, gen generator use the pattern of faces to discriminate whether an image is a real face or not. So discriminator will probably think that if there are two black circles on the image, then it's a real faces. Then the generator is not learned from a specific image. It's learned from the pattern. So, uh, so in, in this way, the generator is looks more like creation instead of copying a specific image. And here is some result in the literature. So this, is, this result is from Google's paper. And in let this paper, they try to compare different kind of GAN. And they also try to compare GAN with VAE. So the main purpose of this paper is to show that all different kinds of GAN, their performance are actually pretty much the same. So those people who is working on GAN are just wasting their time. So this is this paper want to tell us. But there is another thing which is not emphasized in that paper, but I think is pretty critical. They also compare the performance of VAE with all other kinds of GAN. So here they use FID score to evaluate the goodness of the generated image. And they use two corpus, NNIST and Cypher 10, to train their image generator. I will not introduce FID here today, but uh, just keep in mind that the smaller the value means the higher quality of your generated image. So the smaller, the better. And you can find that all different kinds of GAN, although uh, they are pretty much the same, they can achieve much better results compared with VAE. The best result of different kinds of GAN are usually much better than VAE. But VAE is, is more stable, its performance is more stable, and the result of GAN is not as stable as VAE. But this result show that to generate the best images, you need the technology of GAN to achieve the best result. So here is about, uh, 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 just give you a brief example to is to describe how uh, use GAN, how, how we use GAN to generate the image. Then I'm going to talk about some theory behind this technology. So I will skip a few slides. So I put some formulation in the slide, but they are not that important. As uh, I know people do not like to see the formulation. So you can check the formulation yourself after the talk. I will skip most of the formulation today. <laughs> okay, so Actually, your generator define a probability distribution. So you have a generator G, which is a network, and given the network, it define a probability distribution, which is we call PG here. So I will describe how to consider a network as a probability distribution. Here is your generator G, and as we have mentioned several times, the generator G takes a random vector Z as the input, and it will generate an image which is x here. You can consider your generator g as a function. So this function takes z as the input, and the output will be x. Of course, you input different z, then you have different x. Then your z will be simple from a distribution. For example, it can be simple from a normal distribution. It can sample from a normal distribution. After the transform of g, Originally, it's simple from a very simple distribution, but after the transformation of G, G, the output will be a very sophisticated distribution. And this sophisticated distribution is the distribution defined by your generator, which is PG here. And I don't think you have to put too much effort on uh, designing the input distribution, because it, as you know, the network has very large capacity. So even though the input distribution is very simple, it's just a normal distribution or it's just a uniform distribution, after the transformation of many layers, you can obtain a very sophisticated distribution. So this is our generator. It defines a distribution PG. And our learning target is 
we have a real data distribution. This is the real distribution of the image. If you want to do enemy phase generation, this is the distribution of the enemy phase. And you want your PG to be as close to the P data as possible. So you have P data. This is this can be obtained from the real example. So this is the real the distribution of real images, and this is the distribution of your generator. And you want this this two distribution to be as close as possible. This is the training criterion of your generator. So the training criterion of generator can be written as below. You define a divergence. I use div to represent a. Uh, some kind of divergence, and it takes PG as input, it takes P data as input, and compute the divergence between these two distributions. And what you want to train is your generator G. So you want to find a generator, or you want to find a set of parameters for the ger generator which can minimize this divergence. You want to find a generator which can minimize this divergence. If you know how to solve this problem, then that's it. You know how to train a generator. But unfortunately, it's very challenging to solve this problem because we don't know how to compute this divergence. P data is, we, we, you, you cannot write down its formulation. You don't know the formulation of P data. PG uh, is too complicated. It's a network. It's defined by a network. You don't know what its distribution looks like. So you cannot directly compute its formulation. We cannot directly compute its formulation, so we don't know how to solve this optimization problem. So this is why we need a discriminator. So the basic idea here is we do not know the formulation of PG and P data. We cannot write down its formulation. But what we can do is we can sample from these two distributions. How to sample from P data is very trivial. You have a database. You have a database of enemy faces, then sample from this database, you are sampling from PG. So if you sample from this database, you get some enemy faces, those enemy faces can be considered as the data point, sample from the distribution P data. To sample from the distribution PG is also very trivial. You just input some random vector, and this vector are probably sample from a normal distribution. You sample some normal distribution, or you sample some vector from the normal distribution, and the generator will output a set of image. So those image can be considered as sampling from PG. So now we know how to sample from the P data. We know how to sample from PG. Then the next step is based on this sample, we need some way to compute the divergence between these two distributions. We need some way to compute the divergence between these two distributions. So this is why we need a discriminator. So the role of the discriminator is compute this divergence based on the sample. So the idea here is we have some uh, data sample from PG, the blue star. We have some data sample from uh, also, P data are blue star. We have some data sample from PG, the red star. Then, based on this example, we train a discriminator. Then, the objective value of this discriminator will tell us the divergence between these two distribution. So this is the basic idea. As you know, when you train a network, you need to define a loss function, or you need to define an objective function. Then, to train a Network means you want to tune the parameter by gradient ascent to maximize the objective function, right? So to train your discriminator, you have to define an objective function. We call this objective function V here. And you want to find, your dis find a discriminator, or you want to find a parameter in the discriminator to maximize the value of the objective function V. And this objective function V is defined as below. It's defined like this. Is defined like this. Here, the objective function also takes G as input, but actually G is fixed during the training. You only train D, G is fixed. And for rows X, let me describe this formulation. It looks a little bit complicated. So the X is sample from the data distribution. And as we have mentioned, the X, the image sample from the data distribution are real image. They should be assigned large score. So this objective function, we want to maximize log D of x. D of x is the output of your discriminator. So if the x is sample from the real distribution, if x is sample from the real data, you want the output of D of x to be as large as possible. Then for the second term of this formulation, x is sample from PG. It's generated 
by the generator. So for x generated by the generator, you want its d of x to be as small as possible. So here, we want to maximize log 1 minus p d of x. Maximizing log 1 minus d of x means we want to minimize d of x if x is generated by the generator. This is your objective function. Actually, this is not the only way to write down your objective function. We will see different objective function in the following talk. Actually, this is, this is even not the best way to write down your objective function. However, this objective function is very easy to implement. If you are familiar with classification, uh, maximizing this objective function is equivalent to train a binary classifier. When you train a binary classifier, and uh, you will the output of your classifier will be sigmoid function. Then you will use binary cross entropy to minimize your objective function. Actually, minimize binary cross entropy is, is equivalent to maximize the following objective function. So training this discriminator is equivalent to consider those uh, blue point, blue star as class one and red point as class two and train a binary classifier. It's very, it, it's very trivial to implement the training of your discriminator by this objective function. Then the most important thing here is the maximum value you can obtain is related to JS divergence. So you train your discriminator and you will get an optimal uh, objective function. You will get an optimal V. And this op optimal V obtained from your optimal discriminator is actually highly related to the JS divergence between these two distributions. This, of course, can be proved. And here we need an assumption that D of X, your discriminator, have infinite capacity or your discriminator can be any function. The proof is not important, just believe me, it's true. So we just skip it in a very fast way. You can check whether the formulation is correct or not by yourself. So here's the result. The result is when you find a discriminator, your generator is fixed, your generator is fixed. When you find a discriminator which can maximize the objective function v, we defined in the several page before, then the, this value is actually minus two log two plus two uh, JS di two times JS divergence of p data and p g. That's it. So this term is related to the JS divergence. It's not equivalent. Here you have minus two times log two, but this is not important. Okay. So so now this term is related to JS divergence. This result is not surprising because it can be understood in a very in a very intuitive way. Now you have two distribution and these two distribution are overlapped, so they have a uh, small divergence. And because these two distribution are overlapped for the discriminator, it's very hard to discriminate the data from uh, P data or PG. It's hard to discriminate, it's very hard to discriminate these two kinds of data points. So you cannot get large objective value after training because it's very hard to separate these two set of points. So it's not easy to get large objective function value. So you have small objective value, you have small divergence. In another case, if for the discriminator, it's very easy to discriminate these two set of data points. Then the discriminator can obtain larger objective value. When discriminator can object larger, ob uh, uh, larger objective value means these two distribution has large divergence. So it's very intuitive to guess that your objective function, your maximum objective function, the largest objective function you can obtain by your discriminator is related to some specific divergence. And after some math, you know that it's related to the JS divergence. So this is, this is the formulation. So this is the original formulation we want to minimize. We want to find a generator which can minimize the divergence between PG and P data. And as I have mentioned, we don't know how to compute the divergence between these two distributions. So now, but now we know that the distribution between, the divergence between these two distributions is actually related to this term. So uh, when you find a D, which can maximize V of DG, then the result, then the value you obtain is the divergence between two distributions. So you can simply replace this term with this term, right? So you can simply replace this divergence 
with this term. So this is the final formulation you want to solve. So that's it. So this is a min max problem. So usually in the literature of GAN, you will the p the, the paper will tell you that we want to solve a min max uh, optimization problem. So this is where the min max optimization problem come from. So this problem look like this. Uh, so here I use the toy example to try to describe what we want to do in this min max optimization problem. You have several different generators. We have generator one, generator two, and generator three. And for each generator, it can pair with different discriminator. So the horizontal axis means different discriminator. And this objective function will take a generator and the discriminator as input. When the input generator and the input discriminator is different, we obtain different value. But given a generator, suppose we given the generator one, then we can find an optimal discriminator, which lead to the largest objective value. We can find an optimal discriminator, which is D1 star here, which lead to the largest optimal objective value. Then this optimal objective value is actually corresponding to the divergence between generator one and your data. So given generator two, its divergence is the length of this blue line. And given generator three, its divergence is the length of this blue line. So to find the best generator, which one is the best? If you want to compare generator one, generator two, and generator three, which one is the best? If you want to find uh, uh, the, the best generator, which can generate more realistic image, which one I is the best? How about we ask the audience? How, so how many of you f think generator one is the best? So generator two? Generator three? Okay, so most of you think it's generator three, so you understand what I'm talking about. So <laughs> I, I hope you understand what I'm talking about. So generator three is the best generator. Uh, if you compare this three generator, it's the best one. Its divergence is the smallest. If you want to know the divergence between uh, the probability defined by the generator tree and the p data is the smallest, so it's the best generator to generate the images. So, 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 so this is the one you. So this is the one you want to find. So this is your solution if you only have three generator. So this is the optimal gener gen generator. You solve this min max problem. Then we have to solve this min max problem. How to solve this min max problem is by the algorithm of GAN. So in the algorithm of GAN, we say that the algorithm is something look like we have two steps. In first step, we fix the generator and update the discriminator. In second step, we fix the discriminator and update the generator. This algorithm is try to solve this min-max problem. To solve this min-max problem, we use this algorithm. We fix one of, because there are two, one generator, one discriminator here. You fix the generator, update the discriminator. You fix the discriminator, update the generator. Then eventually, hopefully, you can solve this min-max problem. So I'm not going to describe why this algorithm can solve the min-max problem. There are still lots of math in the following pages. You just believe me that you, you can use the algorithm again to solve the min-max problem. So finally, this is the algorithm again. Let's review the algorithm again. So you have your uh, discriminator, you have a generator, and say that D is the parameter of discriminator, and say that G is the parameter. Uh, this is the parameter of your discriminator. This is the parameter of your generator. In each iteration, first you want to train your discriminator. To train your discriminator, you first sample some data x1, x2 to xn. X represent the, date, the object you want to generate. In image generation, x are images. So you sample some x, you sample some image from your data distribution. In the real implementation, you just sample a batch from your data set. You sample, for example, 256 images from your database. Then you sample some noise, z1 to zn, from a prior distribution. Usually, it's simply a normal distribution. Then based on x1 and xn, x1 to xn, you will generate n images. So here are n input vector. Then based on the n input vector, you generate n images. So rows are real image, rows are generated image. Then you train your discriminator by the following formulation. So the formulation looks like this. 
uh, this is just the objective function we have seen before, but in the original objective function, we say we are consider expectation value, but as you know, in real implementation, you, in real implementation, you can never consider expectation value. What you can only know is, what you can only do is sample from the database, sample n image, and you sample n real image, and you want their log d of x to be as large as possible. And then sample another n image, but they are generated, and you want their log one minus d of x tilde to be as large as possible. Or in another word, you want d of x tilde to be as small as possible. Then you try to maximize this objective function by gradient set. This is just simply the formulation of gradient set. This one thing interesting, uh, because as I have mentioned, solving this optimization problem is to evaluate the divergence between two distributions. So you will want to really solve this problem. To really solve this problem, you need to update your, the parameter many, many times. Theoretically, you should update your parameter many, many times until the, 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 div the discriminator converge. But actually, you cannot, but in the real implementation, no one really do that because it will take too much time. So in the real implementation, usually you will repeat this process k time. You will update your discriminator k time to make sure you, the, 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 the value of this v is close to your optimal value. But of course, you can only find the lower bound of this optimal value. Then you will train your generator. So you also sample some z. You also sample some, some z from your prior distribution. And you want to minimize the list objective function. So your uh, discriminator want to uh, maximize this objective function. And your generator want to do in the opposite. It want to minimize this objective function. However, in this objective function, the first term is not related to the generator. So you do not have to put the first term in the objective function of the generator. So what the generator only have to do is minimize the second formulation. Then you try to minimize the second formulation by gradient descent, and you train your generator. But usually, you only update, update once. So this is the whole algorithm of GAN. And there is some vari va variations of GAN. Uh, theoretically, you should write down the objective function of generator like this. You should minimize this objective function. But uh, Ian Goodfellow, the one who invented the GAN thing, uh, this objective function is uh, very slow at the beginning of training, so it modified it in another way. And in its original paper, it never showed the result of this objective function. It only showed the result of the following one, the modified one. I think in the paper of Google, they study different kind of GAN. They think actually these two kind of GAN do not have really different, different result. But uh, in the first paper of GAN, Ian Goodfellow uh, implement this GAN in this way. Actually, if you have really implement GAN, uh, the this objective function is easier to implement than this one. It's hard to describe if you have never implemented it before. This one is easier to, to implement. I believe this is probably the main, the, the one, another reason why Ian Goodfellow used this objective function instead of this one. So this one is called minimax gain, and then gain, and the following one is called non-saturation gain, and this gain. And we have just said that when you trend your gain, you are uh, consider JS divergence. Your discriminator is to evaluate J JS divergence, and your generator try to minimize JS divergence. Then people may, may ask, can we consider other divergence? Can we minimize KL divergence? Can we minimize reverse KL divergence? Of course you can. You can minimize any F divergence you like. So in another paper called FGAN, you can just Google FGAN, it lists it, it, it already proved that you can minimize any F divergence by the framework of GAN. And this is the table from the paper. So it lists all different kinds of uh, F divergence. And by modifying your discriminator, as, as I have mentioned, you have to define an objective function. And the original objective function, which is log d of x and log 1 minus d of x, is related to JS divergence. You can modify your objective function. 
to minimize other kind of diversion, including KL, reverse KL, and so on. So uh, the paper, I list the reference here. This paper, this paper the title of this paper is FGAN. It, it say you can modify the objective function to train the discriminator to consider all different kind of F divergence, including KO divergence, reverse KO divergence, and so on. So this is the theory behind GAN. So what I want to say is the discriminator is trying to uh, evaluate a specific divergence and the generator try to minimize that divergence. Then let's talk about some issue when you train in the GAN. It is very well known that GAN is very hard to train. And one reason is your generate the distribution defined by your generator, which is PG, do not have overlap with P data. So why PG and P data do not have overlap? Here we have two reasons. The first reason is this is the natural of your data. Usually what, what you want to generate is something like image. And it is widely known that image can be considered as low dimensional metaphor in the high dimensional space. So your P data, which is the distribution of, for example, enemy phase, can be considered as a low dimensional metaphor in the high dimensional space. And PG, the distribution generated by a network, can be considered as a low dimensional metaphor in the high dimensional space. So if your space is two dimension and PG and P data are low dimension manifold, which is one dimension, there are two curves in the, in the 2D space, then their overlap can be ignored. This is one reason. This is, so the first reason is PG and P data do not have overlap because this is the natural of the data. Uh, if you do not believe it, I have the second reason. The second reason is PG and P data are actually obtained by sampling. We do not really know the formulation of PG and P data. The divergence of PG and P data are actually obtained from sampling. So for example, this is the real, di real distribution of P data. This is the real distribution of PG. But what you, what you understand, how you understand this two distribution is by sampling. You sampling from this distribution, you sampling from this distribution. If your sample, if you do not have sufficient sample, then these two distribution will look like discrete. If, you're, if the number of sample is limited, you can just consider these two distribution have the boundary like this. So these two, distrib this two distribution will not have any overlap. And if two distribution do not have overlap, then chase divergence is not a suitable divergence to evaluate the divergence between two distribution. Why this happen? Because let's consider three distribution. So this is PG0, this is PG1, this is PG100. And it is very clear that uh, PG1 is better than PG0, right? Uh, PG1 is closer to the P data. PG0 is not as close as PG1. So I believe everyone in this room agree that PG1 is better than PG, PG0. However, if you evaluate the distribution by the JS divergence, this two case actually has the same JS divergence. Because for JS divergence, if two distributions do not overlap, the output of the J, uh, JS divergence will be the same. It's always log two if two distributions do not overlap. So if you evaluate two distributions by their uh, JS divergence, you will find that PG0 is as bad as PG1. So this two distribution, although intuitively this one is better, based on J's divergence, they are equally bad. So in, in, in this case, your training will have some problem. Because you cannot directly transform your generator, you cannot directly update your, the parameter of your generator from PG0 to PG1. You should probably update your generator from PG0 to PG1 to G2, then to G100. However, based on the J's divergence, this two is the same. So this two is equally bad. So you cannot update your parameter from PG0 to PG1. And there's another way to understand why this happened. You, you, if two distribution do not have overlap, and as I have mentioned, training a discriminator is just exactly the same as training a binary classifier, right? So training a discriminator is just exactly the same as training a binary classifier. And if two distribution do not overlap, you can get, always get 100% accuracy from your binary classifier, no matter these two distributions are very close each, 
to each other or far from each other. You can always get 100% accuracy. So the objective value you obtain after the training is always the same. And we say objective value is related to the divergence. So objective value is the same, the divergence is the same. So this, in this page, I want to describe why J's divergence is not a suitable, uh, suitable way to evaluate the divergence between two distributions. And as I have mentioned, you can always change the divergence. You, you, if J's divergence is not a good way to evaluate two distribution, you should just use another divergence. So today, lots of people use Earth movers distance to evaluate the divergence or evaluate the difference between two distribution. And this distance, Earth movers distance, is also called vessel stand distance vessel stand distance. So the gain using vessel stand distance to evaluate the difference between two distribution is called vessel stand gain or W gain. So let me describe earth movers distance a little bit. So in earth movers distance, now you have two distribution. One is P and one is G. And you, imi and you imagine that you are driving a uh, earth mover and you want to move the dust from P to Q. Also, this is one distribution, it's the dust, and you want to move the dust from this here to here. And the average distance you have to drive the earth mover is the vessel stand distance. So in this example, to evaluate the vessel stand distance or earth mover's distance, you just compute the distance between between you just compute the distance between these two distributions. As soon as these two distributions are concentrated on a single point, you just have to compute their distance, then this is the vessel stand distance. And of course, in real case, your distribution can be more complicated. Assume that this is the one distribution, this is uh, another distribution. Based on the definition of Earth, earth mover's distance or vessel stand distance, you want to drive an earth mover to move the dust in like P into the dust into Q. But there are several ways to achieve that. There are several ways to move those dust. One way is you can move the, the move those the, the, the dust here to here and you can move from here to here. This is one way you can do, but you can also move those object from here to here from here to here. So there are several ways. So, so, and if you use this way to move from P distribution to Q distribution, you have smaller distance. And if you use this way, you have larger distance. However, in vessel stand distance, the definition of vessel stand distance is if you have many moving pen, simply choose the one which can lead to the smallest distance. So if this one can lead to the smallest distance, then the distance defined by this kind of moving plane is vessel stand distance. So actually, in this example, the optimal moving plane is look like this. So there are several ways to move your dust, but this is the optimal moving plane. And the distance obtained from the optimal moving plane is the vessel stand distance. So this is the definition of vessel stand distance. And let's skip some page with formulation. So with vessel stand distance, it's a better way to evaluate the difference between two divergences. Because as I have mentioned, if you compare this one and this one from this divergence, they are equally bad. However, if you use vessel stand distance to evaluate the difference between these two distributions, in this case, the vessel stand distance is the uh, distance between these two parallel lines. Let's assume the distance between these two parallel lines is d0, then the vessel stand distance of these two distribution is d0. And in this case, pg50 is closer to p data, so d50 is smaller than d0, so the vessel stand distance obtained here is d50. So based on vessel stand distance, your generator will know that this one is poor and this one is better. So it will update its parameter from here to here, and eventually the two distribution can be overlapped. So this is the benefit of vessel stand gain. So this is the benefit of W gain. So this is the uh, real implementation of W gain. So as I have mentioned, you have to de design your objective function to minimize a specific uh, uh, distance. 
So we have shown how to minimize J's divergence, and this is the formulation for W gain. I'm not going to describe where it came from. So believe me, when you try to optimize this objective function, the result you obtain is better than distance of two distribution. So let me describe this uh, objective function a little bit. So it's very intuitive. It's very intuitive. Here, for x sample from p data, we want its d of x to be as large as possible. For x sample from pg, we want its d of x to be as small as possible. Because here, we have a minus here. So we want to maximize the objective function. We want to maximize the first term and minimize the second term. So for x from the p data, it should be as large as possible. For x from pg, it should be as small as possible. But, but here is a constraint here. The discriminator should belong to a one-listed function. If you do not know why one listed function is fine, uh, just keep in mind that one listed function means the function should be smooth. So it's smooth enough. A smooth enough function is a one listed function. So discriminator has to be smooth enough. It's very intuitive you need this constraint. Because without this constraint, the training will have some problem. Because let's assume your generated data and real data are lie on one dimension. So low, low screen point is from the gen is from the real distribution is from p data and row screen point is from the generated distribution pg based on this objective function you want to learn a discriminator the discriminator want to assign large score to real data so by the first turn you want to assign large score to the real data by the second turn you want to assign small score to the generated data then if you train this discriminator it will never converge right because for this part, it will go to infinity. For this part, it will go to minus infinity. If the green point and your blue point do not have overlap, then it will go to infinity, it will go to minus infinity. So you need some constraint to keep, let you avoid this situation happen. So this constraint is your discriminator should be one this function. Or in another word, your discriminator should be small, smooth. If, so if, if this part go to infinity, this part go to minus infinity, then it's not smooth enough. It's not smooth. So to make this function smooth, here you cannot go. Here the value cannot be too large. Here the value cannot be too small. So your discriminator can be smooth. So this is an intuitive reason why we need a constraint here. So this is W again. So here I try to define what is this is function, but this is not important. So uh, how to make the discriminator smooth? So if you want to solve this problem, you want to optimize this objective function, you will find that there is some problem because you do not know how to put this constraint into the gradient descent, right? In gradient descent, you can uh, minimize, maximize an objective function, but it's very hard to deal with the case with constraint. So if here is constraint, you don't know how to solve it by gradient descent. So in the first paper of WGAN, the authors propose an idea which is called weight clipping. The basic idea is, how to make your discriminator be one listed function? The solution is the discriminator cannot have a very large parameter. So during the training, if your parameter, if the weight is larger than C, then set it to be C. If the weight is smaller than minus C, then set it to be minus C. Uh, people may have questioned that, well, weight clipping doesn't seem to be related to one listed function. Yes, it doesn't seem to be related, so this is not a good idea. Here is another idea. So after again, uh, after W again, we have improved W again. So improved W again use another way to put the constraint of one distance function into the optimization procedure. So in improved W again, uh, this is how it works. So, so for a discriminator belong to one distance function, its gradient, its the norm of its gradient should be smaller than one. You can consider this as the definition of one listed function. So the definition of one listed function is the gradient of this function. Sh the norm of the gradient of this function should be always smaller than one. So it, it, it is smooth. It cannot be too sharp. Then we want to put this constraint into this, into this optimization problem, but it's very difficult. So one way is just put the third term. So we already have two terms from the original objective function. Then we have the third term. This third term is given all the possible x, given all the possible x, we compute the gradient, the norm of the gradient xx, and minus by one. 
if it's larger than zero, then you will get some penalty. If it's smaller than zero, then you will not get any penalty. So here we have a max zero and gradient minus one. So if this term larger than zero means your gradient, the norm of your gradient is la larger than, than one. Your gradient is larger, larger than one, then you will have some penalty. Because uh, as I have mentioned, the definition of one this function is the norm of gradient should be smaller than one. So you can put the penalty into your objective function. If you the discriminator you obtained do not fulfill this objective function, it will have some penalty. So if you use gradient descent to train your discriminator, and eventually you will obtain the discriminator probably fulfill the constraint you put at here. However, the issue is you cannot in enumerate all the possible x because x represent all the possible, all the image space, the whole image space. You cannot enumerate all the, all the possible x. So the idea in the improved W again, they say uh, we cannot consider all the possible x. We can only consider the x sample from another distribution. This distribution is called P penalty. Uh, in the next slide, I will define P penalty. So this is the definition of P penalty. So you have the distribution of P data, you have the distribution of PG, then you sample from P data, you get one point from P data. You get another point from PG, you link them together, and you sample on this link, then you obtain P then penalty. It's very hard to describe why they, why they use the, this approach. Uh, you, so this process will be conducted several times. You sample another point here, you sample another point here, link them together, sample on this line, and those, the, 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 the point on this line also belong to P penalty. So you can simply consider P penalty as the region between P data and PG. So this blue region belong to P penalty. It's very hard to describe why they use P penalty in this way. In their paper they said, uh, anyway, it, it, it's good empirically, okay? Okay, they say, uh, given that enforcing the Lipset constraint everywhere is intractable, enforcing it only along this straight line, only along this straight line, since sufficient and empirically result in good result. This is from the original paper of improved WGAN. And this can be understood in an intuitive way because when you try to update your PG, you want to move those point in the PG to be closer to the P data. So during the training, I think intuitively PG will move from here to here. It will move closer and closer to the P data based on the shape of your discriminator. So only this part, only the region between P data and our PG are influential to the training process. So probably you do not have to consider other area. You only have to consider the area between P data and PG. So this is an intuitive reason why this works. Actually, this is not the final version of improved WGAN. So actually, in the improved WGAN, they say, uh, based on this formulation, we want the norm of gradient to be smaller than one. Larger than one will have the penalty, smaller than one is okay, you will not have penalty. However, in the implementation of WGAN, this is the real implementation. They say, we do not want the gradient to be far from one. Too small, you will also get the penalty. You will also get a penalty. It's very, uh, I, I don't think they have a concrete proof why this happened, and they just give a sentence like this. Simply penalizing overly large gradient also work in theory, but empirically, experimentally, we found that this approach converge faster and to better optimal. So, uh, so if you use this way to implement improved data again, it leads to better performance. So when you try to train the objective function, so this is why your discriminator want to do. For the data from, for the data sample, for the x sample from p data, is d of x should be larger. And for the data sample from pg, its value should be smaller. And for this blue region, we want to keep its gradient to be one. Not too big, not too small. And actually, there is another improved WGAN called improve the improved WGAN published in this iClear. So I'm not going to go through the detail. It used another way to define the P penalty. So, so improve, improve WGAN, use another way to define the P penalty and seem to obtain better result. And there is another approach I'm not going to go through its detail. It's called spectral known. Spectral known is another way to 
directly force your discriminator to have gradient smaller than one everywhere. So it put a constraint on the parameter, and it can be proved that with this approach, your discriminator will always have gradient smaller than one everywhere. So you do not have to worry about how to s define your p, p penalty. So this is another approach you can you can consider. So uh, so oh, okay. So this here, I want to show the algorithm of W game, but it looks like I'm kind of running out of the time. So I think one thing I can do here is we can try to answer some, some questions. Oh, oh, we have only one question. <laughs> In WGAN GP, we sample from P penalty by getting from a line from sample. If sample from P data and PG are not in boundary, I think it will be dangerous. Yes, I I, I totally agree with, with you. So this is not a good idea, actually, but it works empirically. <laughs> but yes, yes, and, and and you look, I try to draw a picture here because originally I want to point out that this is not a good idea because what would happen if this is your data distribution? You sample it here, then for PG, you sample it here, and you have a line like this, and you sample here as the P penalty property. This is not a good way. So if if, if, for, if, if this is PG probably the better way is sample it here. But but you do not know where to sample. It's hard to know where it's a sample. So it looks like improved dark again is still not the optimal solution. So there's still lots of room for the improvement. So, uh, so anyone have any question? Um, I read this paper, spectral normalization, and I kind of have one question regarding this paper. Okay. Um, so in Wasserstein-Gan paper, it's quite obvious that we should limit the discriminator to um, become a function that is constrained, constrained with uh, one lucid, right? But uh, in this paper, they also use that um, with a different um, approach. But um, but they still doesn't use the Wasserstein distance, right? They use the um, JSD. So I, I wasn't sure what uh, was the theoretical justification to constrain the discriminator with. Actually, I do not really have a good answer for this question. This actually question is pretty good. So you, I think what you want to ask is uh, in the spectral known, they do not really consider uh, uh, better than distance. And we need one distance function. We need one the constraint of one distance function because we want to consider better than distance. But uh, unfortunately, they they still consider versus stand, uh, they still have one distance function, but they do not consider versus stand distance. Um, I do not really have an answer for, for your question. I'm sorry about that. Yeah, good question. Uh, if you figure out the answer, please let me know. <laughs> yeah. Um, before we take a break, actually, I if you have never done game before, I highly recommend you try uh, improve W game first because usually it cannot give you the best result, but it's more empirically I think it's more stable than other approach. You can easily get some result, but it is not the best. So after you use improve W again to get the best you get some result and you have confidence that mm, I can get some result then uh, you can try other approach to get the best result. This is my intuition. So we take a break, we go back at uh, we'll back at uh, 3.30.